All right. Good morning, class. Can you guys hear me? All right. Good morning. So we have about um, um, two lectures um, to talk about today. Uh, lecture three point seven and lecture three point eight. Uh, as you can see here, uh, one screen is not working. I tried to fix it, uh, but uh, never mind. We'll just live with one screen. Um, so 3.7 is about binomial random variable. And 3.8 is about geometric random variable. Uh, there are two different random variables that we want to study. If we recall what we have been doing so far in this chapter, chapter 3, We've been talking about different types of random variables. Uh, we talk about the a very simple Bernoulli random variable, which is a coin flip random variable. And then today, we're going to talk about um, this binomial random variable, which is, which is a, a generalization of the um, 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 Bernoulli random variable in the sense that we're going to take multiple coin flips, and then we're going to count the sum of the heads. We want to ask about the probability distribution, the mean and variance, and so on. Then the other random variable, which is uh, lecture 3.8, it is the geometric random variable. And we're going to look at how many times that you want to flip the coin until you hit a head. Uh, so it will be multiple failures followed by one success. How do we calculate that probability? So to start with, I want to uh, talk about the binomial random variable. And uh, instead of going through the, all the equations, I brought a, a little thing here. OK, it's a black box. Um, now, if I open up this lid, you can actually see um, something here. Do you guys see what is inside? There's a little chip inside. OK. Um, can anyone make a guess of what this creature is? Yes. It's actually a camera. It's a prototype, it's a prototype camera that costs maybe uh, more than 10K. OK. OK. This is a prototype camera that uh, me and my collaborators has been building. Uh, uh, it's a camera. Now, um, uh, why do I want to bring a camera as I'm talking about the um, binomial random variable? Um, I'll just put it here. In case people are watching the video, they can see it as a camera here. Um, hey, can you guys see this? Yeah, the camera. OK, so uh, why do I bring up camera? Um, uh, does anyone know how does a camera work? Um, of course, uh, you have camera, you have lens. But at the back of a camera, there is a little piece of uh, silicon that's called an image sensor. So what kind of image sensor are we using in our uh, cell phones today? Does anyone know? No, you guys don't know. You just, you just know iPhone 14, uh, which is fine. But at the back of iPhone 14, uh, this is the SE. Um, and there is a little th sensor. There are two types of uh, image sensors. One is called the charge couple device, CCD. Uh, and then the other one is called the CMOS. Uh, so make a guess. What kind of sensor are there in, in an iPhone? Is it a CCD or a CMOS? Electrical engineers, come on. <laughs> this is not computer science, OK? You guys should know. Uh, so what, what, what kind of sensor are there at the back? It's a CMOS sensor, OK? It's a CMOS sensor. Uh, who uses CCD? Uh, if you do scientific imaging, you're going to use CCD. Uh, CCD is a lot better uh, for those kind of applications. Uh, so for CMOS uh, image sensors, um, now, how does that work? How does a CMOS sensor work? Well, you put a sensor over here, and then of course the light will come. The light is either a wave or uh, a photon. It depends on which perspective you want to take. So let's imagine that it is a photon. Okay, so photon comes to your sensor. Uh, then your sensor is going to do something. Otherwise, it's gonna, not going to give you image. What are the things that is done by the sensor? Photon, right? Yes or no, but photon hits your sensor. Uh, your sensor is going to do something. 
So photon carries energy. It hits your sensor. The energy got transferred from the photon to the silicon, and it's going to excite your PN junction. Right? You still remember that class? <laughs> PN junction, this is, this is ECE, okay? This is not CS. That's why I need to talk about these. So you have a PN junction. So as the photon comes, your photon energy is going to transfer to your PN junction, right? So, so you have this hole and you have electron pair. They're going to pull apart. Still remember all these goodies, okay? So then, then you will create some current, current which, which start to drive, right? And then you have uh, electrical signals. Then the electrical signals, so you can measure them, and then you can store it in a well, substrate, right? There's a well, then you store them, and then you pull the signal out. So, so this is the fundamental principle of a CMOS sensor. Now, in, the difference between CMOS and CCD is that uh, in CMOS, every pixel, you will have a readout circuit, a little readout circuit that is... Uh, uh, you're going to read out per pixel. Okay, so it's called an uh, anti-pixel uh, uh, design. And for CCD, you're going to read out the entire row at once. Okay, so um, now imagine that when you have a sensor, um, your sensor is going to store electrons or charges, right? It's a storage. Um, this is a digital device, and so the more charges you have, the more signals, or the more brighter the scene it will be, right? So let's say you're, you're taking a picture of an outdoor scene, you have a lot of uh, uh, light, then of course your, 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 your well will be filled up much quicker because they have more energy, more photons, uh, you have more electrons, more charges. Okay, so now imagine that um, you buy a uh, iPhone, Compared to you buy a Canon, uh, give me a name, maybe 5D, okay? A DSLR camera. What is the difference between these two sensors? One is much smaller, right? In, in, the, in the well, in the, in, in the well capacity, full capacity. Now, um, does anyone know what is the, um, the, the dimension of each pixel here? You buy the cell phone, you never, you never look into the specification. Come on, electrical engineers, okay? You got to look, look at these. When you buy the cell phone, you're gonna look at what the specification. This is about one micron. Each pixel is about one micron, okay? Now, if you buy a Canon uh, camera, that's about 3.5 micron. So, so, so what is the difference between a 3.5 micron and one micron, besides numbers? In terms of image quality, what is the difference? Bigger cell versus a smaller cell. Yes. Uh, ISO is a different thing. ISO is a gain. It is, it's a gain, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a conversion gain that you can put onto the uh, sensor. So even for the small pixel, you can still have a high, high ISO. So, so it's not an ISO. Uh, yes. Okay, more information can be captured and stored. Okay, that, 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 that's true. Okay, so you have a bigger cell. And so the, the, the per unit area is bigger. Okay, so, so you have one cell, but it's a bigger cell. And so at, as photon comes, you can, at the same, during the same period of time, you can collect more compared to a smaller one. So what will happen is that uh, if you take a DSLR camera, take a picture, it, you have a much better signal to noise ratio, much cleaner signals, because each pixel is bigger. But then in this cell phone, this little cell phone here, it is so small that uh, each pixel, you can only catch a few photons, right? So that's the difference. And so the image quality produced by these phones are much worse, much, much worse. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the image processing uh, uh, algorithm behind this. This is a lot more smarter than the, the DSLR. DSLR doesn't do any processing. You can pull out the raw. Uh, but for these phones, they have a lot of back-end computing uh, going on. Uh, as a side comment, these guys, they don't take a single picture. They always take multiple pictures and do the image fusion, uh, if you don't know what's going on here. We can talk about that later. Um, so now, think about the extreme case. Think about the extreme case. Uh, you have a camera that's no longer this big cell. It becomes smaller, 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 and smaller. Okay, why do we want to make the cameras smaller and smaller and smaller? Why? 
Yeah? A smaller, more efficient? Um, probably not, because smaller means you have more noise. Uh, it's not even more efficient. But why do we want to make it smaller? Yes? Better resolution. Better resolution. Okay, so, 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 so now we are getting the uh, core point. Um, remember, um, maybe 10 years earlier, okay, maybe you were still in high school, do you realize that every cell phone company is is, is having a slogan, oh yeah, we have, a, we have more pixels. Well, we have one megapixel phone, and then we have two megapixel phone, and then we have four megapixel phones. So the higher the pixel, then the higher the price they can, they can sell. Uh, that was the period of the way we call the pixel war. Uh -huh. So every, every phone company, every, every camera company is trying to say that we have, we have uh, more pixels. So resolution is one. The other reason is that you want to put it into miniature uh, robots. Uh, small, tiny robots uh, that, that has a uh, lot of restrictions on size, weight, and power. So you want to have a smaller uh, 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 pixel. Okay, so now think about the extreme, okay? Uh, this is related to binom binomial random variable. Uh, why, why, what will happen if your sensor is extremely small? Okay, extremely small to a point that your sensor can only hold one photon. Okay, so now originally you have a big, big cell, you can have a lot of photons. We're talking about uh, typically the full capacity for these sensors, uh, 8,000 to uh, 12,000 electrons. We're talking about that scale. So let's push it down to only one photon. Okay, one single photon. The, the full cell is so small that it can only hold one photon. Uh, what do you get? What kind of image are you getting? One photon, okay. Your, your, your full capacity is only holding one photon. What kind of image is the sensor producing? Yes? Okay, so if I give you a um, digital image, that is a 16-bit, 14-bit to 16-bit image, ADC, okay? So 16-bit, uh, so, so you have a total of 16 levels. Uh, so that could be grayscale, now you can add color later on. Um, what will happen if you only have one photon? What kind of image do you get? Exactly, it's going to be a black and white image. Just black and white, not, just, not even grayscale. It will be a black and white image. And so here is a picture, okay? Uh, here is an image that you're going to get. And then inside this image, I'm going to zoom in, and zoom in, you are going to see things like that. Ones and zeros, black and white. Black and white, okay? A lot of these black and whites. Now you say, okay, um, where will I get a black? Where will I get a white? Well, it depends on the brightness of your scene. If it is a bright area, you're going to get more ones. Uh, now, the, 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 term, the terminology here is that White means one, black means zero. Okay, don't think that, no, that's a black, that's a black ink, is one, okay? Uh, the, uh, it is brighter, then you have more ones. One is zero. Uh, one, one is uh, a bright, white. Okay, so now, because you have ones and zeros, what kind of random variables are we talking about here? Two state, one and zero, what is the random variable? Last lecture. Bernoulli random variable, okay? It's a Bernoulli random variable. Every pixel here, it is a Bernoulli random variable. There is a underlying probability, P, which is a number between zero and one. What does that stand for? Yes? Being white or black. So if I have a bright pixel, bright scene, right? Should the P be close to one, or should the P be close to zero? P should be close to one, okay? If it is a very bright area. If I have a very dark area of the scene, that P should be very close to zero. So, so, the, so for this image, you have a lot of P's. Okay, every pixel you have a different P. And then for the same location, you're gonna draw this uh, binary random variables, ones and zeros, over time. Okay, not over space, but over time. So, now here's the interesting thing. If I give you one binary measurement, okay, one binary measurement, 
uh, there is really no way that you can go back and say, hey, what is the underlying image? Because what you have is a binary image. That's what you have. But if I give you a stack of 30 frames or 64 frames, and assume the scene is not moving, okay? I give you a stack of 64 frames, binary images, what will be the underlying image? Can we estimate that? It becomes possible. If I give you 64 frames, 128 frames, 512 frames, the more frames I give you, I think we will be able to estimate the underlying P for every pixel. The simplest solution is just take like an average. Uh, if, if I have more ones in my, in, my, in my stack, then that means that pixel has to be brighter. If I have more zeros, that pixel has to be darker, right? And just taking the average, I will be able to do some calculation. So the moment you start to take average of all these Bernoulli random variables, you're doing this binomial random variable. The sum of many Bernoulli is a binomial. That's just the definition. So as we are learning this lecture here, uh, keep in mind what will be the application that we can think about. Well, this is one application. You actually, you, you're not just flipping a coin many, many times and count the number of heads. That is useless. In, in real life, you will never run into this kind of problem. But if I tell you that there is an image sensor that is taking pictures like that, then you need to take the sum of all these binary bits. Then it is a, bi a binomial random variable. That is very meaningful. You want to understand the probability distribution, statistics, and all, the, all these summaries. Okay? So what is this creature here? This is a GigaJot um, Pathfinder camera. GigaJot is a solid company in Pasadena that we have been working for uh, many, many years. Um, Inside this camera is a, a little uh, a single photon uh, sensor. In fact, here you can see there are 25, uh, 20, 20 uh, sensors. And that, that, so so it's, a, it's a prototype. So we have 20 sensors put in there uh, and see which one fail, which one is uh, working. Um, this sensor, um, it is a multi-bit uh, sensor meaning that we can take uh, three bits of eight bits, and then after you get the signal, then we can dump it back to one bit. Uh, so this one has an extremely low dark count, uh, in case you don't know what is dark count. Uh, whenever you, 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 take, you turn on the camera, you turn on the camera, you do not take any picture at all. Uh, if this camera is already generating some signal, that's called a dark current. Okay, so this is a lot like a ba background signal that's generated by the sen sensor. So it has an extremely low uh, dark count. Um, it also has a very, very low uh, read noise. So every time you read out a signal, there's, there's a read noise associated with it. Uh, so it also has a very low read noise. Um, the two together can help you do the photon counting. Uh, if you do not have a, a low enough uh, dark count, that means you have a lot of background noise. Uh, you cannot count. Um, if your read noise is too high, then you cannot separate one photon versus two photon because you will just mess up the two pulses. Uh, so you can, you can do that with a very powerful uh, sensor. Uh, this sensor is originated from uh, Dartmouth College, and then it went to GigaJot, and then we are the, sort of the, um, the back-end people to design the algorithms to, to, to really take these binary images and then turn it into um, uh, grayscale images for moving videos. Uh, so over the past couple of years, we have been doing uh, many of things, uh, including this. Uh, this is a uh, real capture, not, not in Zoo, okay? But um, we display this image on a, uh, on a screen in our dark room, and then we use um, really this camera to take a picture, uh, and then you can get to this quality. This is the uh, CMOS camera that you will find uh, from these uh, phones. Okay, and so we take a picture of those, and then we retrain um, networks and to classify them. Now I'm not sure if you can see that. Uh, we can actually uh, determine the, the label. Uh, this is a black bear. So of course we have a lot of angle from sitting behind uh, to uh, read this uh, extremely noisy image, and then we have a way to, um, to recognize the pattern from, from this noise. Um, <clears throat> another example here. This is uh, image reconstruction. 
so this is a rotating fan. Uh, we can take this uh, sequence of binary images. We can turn it into this uh, grayscale image. This is another example. This is provided by, um, I think this is provided by EPFL. This is provided by uh, Edinburgh. Uh, the, these are the raw inputs. Uh, so you have oscilloscope, and then we take these images, we can turn it into this quality. And so a lot of image processing statistics going on, leveraging the binomial uh, statistics, and then we can do uh, signal processing. Okay, all cool, uh, exciting, right? So let's talk about some math. So what is a binomial random variable? A binomial random variable is, as I said, it's just the sum of uh, n conflicts. That's the, that's the nature of this random variable. So you get a head, I get a head, and a head. I ask what is the total number of heads? Three heads. What is the probability? Well, it will be one over eight because uh, one half, one half, one half, right? Um, the definition, we can come back to this later, but I want to um, uh, at least uh, show you the, the, the thinking process, okay? So let's say I flip the coin three times. I want to find the probability of getting three heads. Now you can associate this problem with this um, binary sensor, uh, ones and zeros, you get three ones. Uh, what is the probability of getting three heads? It will be the probability of getting head and head and head, and they are independent events. And so by the axiom, I can separate them into, uh, oh, not, not axioms, just, just three ends, okay, three ends, uh, uh, n of h and h and h. Uh, that would just be the, um, the products of three probabilities. That, so that's, the, that's the independence property, okay? If we recall the definition of independence, uh, two, uh, the and the intersection of two events can be written as a product of two, two probabilities. So that's the independence. Um, then uh, you can write it in, into, into this, and then each one you have a probability of p, and therefore you have p to the power three for this problem. So what is the probability of getting two heads? Well, getting two heads means that you get head and head and tail, or head, tail, head, or uh, tail, head, head, either one. Either one case will work. So uh, for each one, you have 2p, so you have p squared, and then you have 1 minus p, right? So the p will associate with the head, another p will associate with head, and then 1 minus p will associate with the tail. So you have p squared, 1 minus p. Uh, here you have uh, p squared, 1 minus p for uh, two head and one tail. This one you have uh, uh, p squared and 1 minus p for uh, tail and two heads. So when you add them up, you have three times uh, p squared or 1 minus p. So this is the probability of getting two heads. So you can do the same exercise for uh, one head and zero head. Then you're gonna get uh, a probability mass function. You're gonna get a probability mass function. Looks like this. Uh, zero, uh, one, two, uh, three. Uh, this is one eighth, this is uh, three eighth, three eighth, uh, and then one eighth. And now if you look at this number, one, three, three, eight, that should look familiar. That's the Pascal triangle. If you look at this combinatorics, right, I, I explained this before, this is the n choose k operator. If I have n equals to three, and then k equals to zero, one, two, and three, then you have n, uh, three choose zero, that is one. Three choose one, that's three. Three choose two is three. Three choose three is one. So one, uh, one, three, three, one. So that's the n choose k factorial, okay? And then uh, you have this p to the power k and one minus p to the n minus k. So just go back to this example here. Uh, when, when n is uh, three, k is three, you have three heads, then p to the power three, right? And then one minus p will be three minus three, so you get zero. So this one will be gone, right? So now you can write down this table. As k equals to zero, k equals to one, k equals to two, k equals to three, then this p to the power k, and then one minus p to the power n minus k, uh, assuming that n is three, then here you will get what? Uh, one minus p to the power three. Then here you will get a p, and then one minus p uh, square. This is p squared, one minus p. This is um, p q. You see that, right? And then for each one, then this, uh, uh, this is the, uh, let me see. This is the uh, n choose k. Then here you will have one, three, three, one. 
So what is P? P in my case, it will be P equals to one half because it, it is a fair coin, right? And therefore you have this uh, one over A, which is the, uh, the third power of one half. Then you have one three three A go with uh, this uh, one eighth, so then you can get this uh, probability mass function. Okay, so this is a construction of the binomial random variable. And uh, the general definition is this. Uh, if x is a binary random variable, then, then, the, then the PMF would be given by this formula. n choose k, p to the power k, or 1 minus p to the power n minus k, where k will go from 0, 1, all the way to n. Okay, now this is the, uh, the symbol for this binomial random variable. You have uh, two parameters, unlike the Bernoulli random variable, you only have one parameter. Here you have two parameters. The first parameter will specify the number of uh, trials. The second parameter will specify the probability. Now, if we go back to this camera here, uh, you, you look at this picture, right? this uh, Statue of Liberty uh, example. Uh, the P is changing. Okay, so the P is changing for every pixel location. And so you have a different P for every pixel. At every coordinate, you have a different binomial random variable. The n would be the same because you take 10 frames, the n would be 10. The p would be different. Brighter scene, you have a higher p. Darker scene, you have a lower, a lower p. Okay? So, so your p is changing. Um, uh, and so uh, the, the estimation typically will be done per pixel. For this pixel location, I will estimate what is the underlying p. Binomial random variable is uh, it's a little bit more interesting than the um, Bernoulli random variable. I can plot out um, the, the shape of the um, binomial PMF. Uh, I can change the, um, the two parameters. So if I fix n equals to 60, then I use uh, different p's, p equals to 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9. Uh, you can see that the, the, the concentration of the mass will be allocated to a smaller value when your p is small. It will allocate, it will be more concentrated on a higher value when, when uh, this, this, this is wrong. This is 0 0.9, this is 0.5, okay? Uh, if it is 0.5, it will, it will be centered. If it's 0.9, it will be uh, skewed towards the other end. So this is the effect of the parameter. Uh, this is the effect of the, um, of the uh, number of samples. So if you have, um, let's say you have a fair coin, and then you only flip the coin uh, five times, then you may be more concentrated, and it's more narrow. It's very narrow pulse in, in the beginning. Whereas if you have 50 uh, uh, trials, then the distribution become uh, wider and wider. And eventually you can see that it's getting to a shape that is quite similar to a normal distribution. Okay, so we'll come back to that point later. But I just want to uh, bring to your attention that uh, the PMF will change as you change these two parameters. The moment of a binomial random variable is given as follows. Uh, the expected value of a binomial random variable is n times p. Uh, the second moment is given by this ugly formula. The variance is n times p times 1 minus p. Now, you can, of course, go through this tedious derivation uh, to prove, okay, which I will not do it. You, I encourage you to read it, but I'm not going to do it because it's too tedious. Uh, the way to do it is that, uh, let's say you want to calculate the expected value of this random variable x. Um, you have a k here, right? So k times uh, the p uh, uh, k. Okay, so your state times the probability sum over all the possible state. That would be the expected value. Now you can do this exercise. What I want to do, because I'm an engineer, I want to tell you a shortcut of how to do it. Um, so, how do we calculate the expected value of x? Why do we know that this is n times p? And here is a physics argument. Let's say I have coins i1, i2, through in. I have n coins, okay? They are binary, binary one and zero, okay? And then I'm gonna add them up and define an x. So x equals to i1 plus i2 plus dot, 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 plus i n. This is my binomial random variable. I know by construction this is a binomial random variable. 
These are all Bernoulli random variables, ones and zeros. I want to find the expected value of x. That means I want to find the expected value of i1 plus i2 plus dot 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 plus in, right? Okay, and then now I haven't taught you one thing, but I will, I will just tell you now that if all these ins, they are independent, then your expectation can go into each individual guys. Well, even if they're not independent, you can do that because this is, um, this is um, uh, expectation. Expectation is linear. Anyway, so the expectation can be applied to each individual. That's a beauty. Okay. Now, what is the expected value of this um, I1? That is just the expectation of a Bernoulli random variable. What is the expectation of a Bernoulli random variable? P. So you have P over here. This is P. This is P. How many P's do I have? N. So I have N times P. So life is good. Proved. Okay. Uh, instead of going through all these nightmares, you can see here, that's it. Okay? Now, how do we prove the variance? Let's also prove the variance. Um, the variance of a binomial random variable, it is going to be the variance of i1 plus i2 plus dot 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 plus i n. Okay? Again, I am using a property that I haven't taught yet, uh, but I will tell you that this is going to be the variance of I1 plus the variance of I2 plus dot 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 plus the var variance of IN. Okay? Uh, to be discussed later, not now. Okay, so once you have this, then what is the variance of a Bernoulli random variable? It's a P for expectation, then the variance will be P times 1 minus P. So here is P times 1 minus P. This is P times 1 minus P. This is P times uh, 1 minus P. So how many P times 1 minus P are there? N of those, N times P times 1 minus P. Again, very, very happy. Okay, so compared to this creature, now if you want to put a square and then do the thing, that would be pretty good exercise uh, to, uh, to brush up your uh, infinite series <laughs> calculation. Um, but you don't have to do that, right? So life is good, uh, everyone's happy. So you can do this calculation by using the physics. So uh, we know the um, um, binomial random variable, we can calculate its expectation, its variance, we know that. We can also calculate is um, um, the CDF, which is just the cumulative sum. And unfortunately, there is no easy formula, and I don't expect you to remember this formula. I just show you the, the picture, and that's the picture of a bar. Uh, the CDF of a binomial random variable uh, basically just do the cumulative sum. And this shape looks like a normal distribution, and this CDF will look like a CDF of a normal distribution, which you will you'll realize that later. Okay. Again, why uh, it's called the central limit theorem? I can explain it to you later. Okay. Okay. Um, we have already talked about that. Okay. Any questions uh, so far? Good. Okay. Uh, as a side remark, I the reason I I really like double E than computer science is not just a cultural difference is that I really like this kind of thing. <laughs> so if you're in a double E program, um, uh, I hope one day, not now, one day you will, you will uh, really enjoy the physics, you will enjoy the device, you will enjoy the, uh, the circuits a little bit more than you want to do data science um, and machine learning. Uh, those are really interesting things, but if you, are, if you call yourself a double E major, uh, this, is, this is a very representative thing. Or a double E major. Uh, uh, I came from a optimization and signal processing background. I used to do more on the theory side, but then um, uh, in the recent years, I spent most of my time dealing with this thing. It's, it's very interesting, um, and 
uh, you can take pictures that you are not able to take, and uh, you will be able to uh, understand all these um, little tiny details of how people actually build a sensor. Uh, you look at the history, come from the photographic films nowadays to these uh, digital sensors and back to this binary frames. Um, there's actually a very beautiful line that you can connect all these dots. Um, if you look at this uh, uh, Statue of Liberty example, um, this is binary, or even, even this one. Okay, or maybe this one, okay. Um, it's actually very, very similar to the good old days photographic films. Does anyone know how photographic films work? Now, you haven't taken a chemistry class. Uh, anyone has used those uh, Kodak film before? Okay, you used before, right? So how does it work? There's a little um, analog material. Right? It's called a photographic film. And, and uh, the inside this film, they are the silver halide molecules. Okay, now you realize, how can this professor know all these? Uh, it's, it's because uh, I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> okay, all right, so, so this is um, the silver halide films. And then now when the, when the sunlight uh, exposes the silver halide films, there will be some chemical reactions going on. The bonds got broken, okay? And some bonds will got uh, glued together. And so now, uh, and then you, you, this is the exposure, and you put it into the, uh, the we call it the uh, development, there's a solution, chemical solution, that you're gonna eat away um, the, some other chemicals. Then, um, then uh, the silver halide molecules, the bonds, they will either click together, or they will, they will be separated, okay? The ones that are clicked together, they'll become opaque. So the light cannot go through anymore. So those will be the dense areas and uh, those will be the dark areas, right? And then those um, that got broken, and then you have more transparent, so you have more light. Um, so these are the density, right? So the density of these um, opaque and transparent molecules, one and zeros, is actually reflected right here. Ones and zeros, the density of ones and zeros is, a, is the digital analog of the good old photographic films, okay? And so you ask, what is the resolution of uh, this, uh, this thing here? It would be the size of each pixel. What would be the resolution of your photographic film? You can actually ask the, the resolution photographic film, by the way. Photographic film, it has a resolution. Resolution is not a digital thing, okay? Uh, the photographic film, you can, you can measure the size of each silver halo molecule. And those will be comparable to these. All right, you don't realize that. And the, the, the older ones, they are bigger molecules. The fabrication is not that good. Uh, so, so those resolution will be, will, be, will be worse because the molecules, they are they're bigger. Uh, nowadays, uh, um, of course, there are fewer people working on films, um, but then technology today can achieve very, very good quality films. So anyone is still taking film pictures nowadays? No one. It's more like a hobby than than really uh, doing the science. I think the digital sensors today um, are getting uh, much better um, than the films. Although some people will still argue for films. I will, I'm more, uh, uh, more advanced. I'm more like, uh, we want to push the technology to the front end, so I, I would prefer to use the digital one. Um, yeah, if you want to talk about the uh, sensor, just come afterward and I can tell you a lot about the sensor. It's, it's very fun. All right, so for the sake of time, I want to move on. Is it okay? Any question? Nope. Good. Okay. So this is uh, lecture 3.8. It's a little bit brief. Um, there, uh, there isn't much uh, thing going on here. This is called the geometric random variable. I just, I just want to briefly touch upon that. Who knows if you need to use uh, this model later on. Um, it's more math oriented. Basically, it's a bunch of equations. Um, uh, but it's pretty easy to understand. So uh, the, the scenario is as follows. Uh, you flip a coin. You flip a coin uh, uh, until you get a head. Okay, so, so here's a penny, and then you get a head. The probability of getting a head would be one half. If the first one is a tail, you flip again. What is the probability that you will eventually get a head? It will be one fourth. Uh, three times one eighth, uh, four times one sixteen, right? So you, you, 
you fail, 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 and then you get a, you get a succeed. So uh, hopefully this is not your experience of taking 302. Uh, so you, I don't, you don't want you to run into this kind of geometric random variable. So it will be like this. Uh, and then the probability has to be one, right? You don't want it to be half. You want uh, the probability passing the, the course will be one. Okay, so this is a uh, geometric random variable, uh, a bunch of failures followed by a success. By the way, this is, uh, if you want to go for a PhD program, you will be like this. Okay, if you do research, it will be like this. Uh, taking course is usually that. Uh, anyway, okay. So uh, a geometric random variable, as you can imagine, it will be given by this formula. You have one minus P to the power K minus one. So this accounts for failure. K minus one failures followed by one success. Right, uh, again, right, so one minus P accounts for the failure. You get failure, failure for K minus one times all failure until you get success. Now, there is no this combinatorics standing in front of it. There's no n choose K because it has to be all fails followed by one success. I cannot flip the order. If I flip the order, this is no longer geometric. It got to be fail all the time. So you look at me, right? So I do experiments, uh, fail, fail, fail all the times, and then, and then I success, and then make this one, right? So this is the geometric random variable. If I uh, do experiment once and twice and success, uh, uh, this is no longer geometric random variable. A lot of failures, and then you have a success. Um, okay, so uh, when you look at this formula, there is no n choose k, bear in mind. And also, this is uh, k minus one. You're going to have k minus one failures followed by one success. Um, the PMF shape will follow this. You have, uh, if you have uh, this, uh, this is your K, okay? So uh, let's say you have a fair coin, then the probability of getting uh, one head will be this. Uh, you have, you will success after two times, success after three times and so on. Okay, so this is the, the shape of the geometric distribution. And you can see why this is one minus P to the power K minus one and then P. So, uh, depends on your choice of this um, a P. Let's say your P is one half. If P is one half, then you have one minus one half to the power K minus one times one half. But one minus one half is one half, so you have one half to the power K minus one times one half. So you have one half to the power uh, K. So every time you're just uh, decreasing. So this is the PMF of a geometric random variable. Um, because of this uh, definition, um, let me see. Because of this definition here, uh, let's say your PMF uh, Px of k is uh, one half to the power k, right? Let's say this is your um, PMF. Then uh, what is it? It is just a geometric series. If you want to calculate some of the Px of k, uh, then that's geometric series. If you want to calculate expectation, then you have k times Px of k. And that is another geometric series. So you can use all the techniques that we have learned to solve problems like these. The probability of success, if P is one half, then the probability of success after one attempt is one half. After two attempts, it will be one half plus one fourth. So you get 0.75. Uh, three attempts, it will be the sum of these. Four attempts, it will be this. Uh, can anyone tell me what is going on here? Uh, this is this number, right? This number, uh, they're the PMF. What am I doing here if I am adding these numbers up? What do these numbers stand for? CDF, exactly, okay? This is a CDF. So this, the PMF of um, the uh, geometric distribution is like this. This is PMF. And then the CDF will be like this, right? So it's going to uh, one. This is a CDF. Uh, this height of the CDF has a physical meaning. It means that it is success after k attempts. Okay, so each pulse has a physical meaning. The shape of the geometric random variable, you can use MATLAB or Python to play around these numbers. It's just generated uh, using a program. Uh, if your p is small, then your decay rate will be, will be low. 
if your P is large, your decay rate will be will be high. Okay, um, and uh, if your P is small, then you start with a lower value, whereas you if your P is big, you start with a higher value. Uh, CDF of a uh, geometric random variable is given by this formula. Uh, we can easily show it because uh, f of k is just the summation of the px of k. k will go from uh, 1 all the way to, uh, I have put a k prime because this is a running index, uh, all the way to this k. So we can do this calculation and you can say k prime equals to 1 to big k. And then this is 1 minus p to the power k prime minus 1 times p. And you can use your geometric series and then do the rest and then show this result, which I will skip here. Okay. Again, this is just tedious algebra, which doesn't have much um, uh, physical meaning here. Uh, the uh, moments of a geometric random variable, again, is just tedious calculation. You say expect a value of x. Um, how do we calculate that? It is the summation of a k times, this is 1 minus p to the power k minus 1 times p. Uh, k will go from 1 to infinity, right? And so uh, you can pull out the k, uh, p, and so you have k going from 1 to the infinity, k times 1 minus p to the power k minus 1. This is just geometric series, the first order geometric series. And so that will give you uh, 1 over p. Uh, remember this formula, right? Sum of r, uh, k times r to the power k minus 1. Uh, k going from 1 to infinity, this is 1 over 1 minus r squared. Right? You can just use this formula to show it. Uh, finally, uh, large, largest variance, uh, since um, this variance equals to 1 minus p divided by p squared, when will you have the largest variance? Well, the largest variance uh, will appear at when p is uh, close to zero. Uh, you can show that. Okay. So as for the physical meaning, I will leave it to you as an exercise. Just think about why it is happening. Okay. So I know I'm rushing through this uh, geometric uh, random variable very quickly, but I guess um, there isn't much uh, thing going on here that will that will require us to spend a lot of time on. Uh, once you sit down when you do the exercise, you will realize um, this geometric uh, random variable. Okay. Uh, it's not included in the in the exam number one. Uh, one. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, yeah. So that's the end of today's lecture. And then uh, when we come back, I'm going to talk about one more random variable. It's the Poisson random variable.